You're listening to The Carbon Arc. I'm Toby Roan. Welcome to The Carbon Arc. My guest today is Mr. Bob Madison. He's a writer, a public relations guy, and a lifelong movie nut. Recently, he wrote the narration for the documentary Dark Shadows and Beyond, and it's been nominated for a Daytime Emmy. His comic novel Cash and Carry will be released later this year by Vulpine Press. Now, I first met Bob through my Westerns blog, and we found we were both really hung up on The Lone Ranger. Over plenty of emails and some phone calls, we realized we also had oddly similar tastes in movies. Which brings us to the subject of this episode, Frank Tashlin's Son of Paleface. It stars Bob Hope, Jane Russell, and Roy Rogers, and it's the rare sequel that leaves its ancestor in the dust. Am I in love? Am I in love? Well, I really wish I knew. All I know is I want to sigh when you're standing near. I get a humpty dumpty feeling. All I know is I want to sigh like I've never sighed before. Now, when you're in love, they say you can tell. You're sick in the heart and you never get well. Or maybe they're right. I wish that I knew why I feel the way I do. Am I in love? Am I in love? Well, I'll leave it up to you. All I know is I wanna dance when I look at you. I get a tippy tappy feeling. All I know is I wanna dance like I've never danced before. My head's in a whirl, my heart's in a spin, and if I'm in love, I love what I'm in. I don't know why I'm feeling this way, but the feeling feels okay. Am I in love? Am I in love? Well, I really couldn't say. All I know is I wanna sing. You smile at me. I get a kind of ping pong, a ding dong, a dizzy feeling. All I know is I wanna sing like I've never sung before. My head's in a whirl, my heart's in a spin. If I'm in love, I love what I'm in. I don't know why I'm feeling this way, but the feeling, the feeling feels okay. Now when you're in love, they say you can tell You're sick in the heart and you never get well So maybe that's why I'm feeling this way Cause my heart does bumps and the temperature jumps Yes, my hair gets blue when I'm thinking of you But the feeling, the feeling feels okay Oh, there it goes again But the feeling feels okay well, hello, Bob. Hello, Toby. How are you? This is impossible. <laughs> Thank you for having me here. And the thing that I find fascinating is that this is what we're talking about, Son of Paleface, when over the years we loved King Kong Escapes and Hearts of the West and The Lone Ranger and, and Taste the Blood of Dracula and God knows what else. And, and here we are with one of our favorite pictures, Son of Paleface. So it couldn't have been better. Yep. I'm always amazed at the movies that we both end up liking. Well, we both agree that this is a pretty special movie for us and a special movie in general. So let's take turns talking about what's so great about it. So whenever, whenever anybody's talking about one of their favorite movies, you, you have to get sort of the backstory um, because nobody just sees something and then it's one of their favorite movies. I saw this when I was a kid. NBC, which was Channel 4 in New York, had the Paramount package and they were playing a lot of the Paramount pictures in the afternoon about four o'clock. So I saw this about four o'clock after school. And even when I was a kid, maybe uh, 12, I knew this was different from other movies. And of course, everybody's favorite movie is different from other movies. But but this, I think, is, is really unique in a, in a kind of special way. Because so this is going to sound ridiculous, but but comedies are funny. Right. And musical comedies are funny and tuneful. But there's something inexplicable about um Son of Paleface. And it might be nothing more than its energy, because it's got this real energy and and its color palette. 
because mm -hmm. it is such a striking technicolor picture to look at. I mean, it's one of the few movies you could watch and your eyeballs get fat. Um, or maybe it's, it's that it's just sort of unapologetically an entertainment. And the fact that they're so proud that it's artifice is what makes it so irresistible. Uh, or maybe it's just, it's funny and it's great looking and, and, and you can sing to it. But I, 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 I think it is the great comedy of the 50s. Uh, and that includes some like it hot, suck it up, Marilyn Monroe. I mean, I think uh, Son of Paleface is the best comedy of the 50s. Wow. I, it's irresistible. And here's the other thing. It's interesting in that, as, as you know, I love comedies. And uh, uh, this one makes me feel different than other comedies make me feel. It leaves me with this sort of energy and, and, and optimism that sometimes even the best of comedies don't leave you with that. Um, but it's like a tonic, you know, you, you, it's, it, it's like Red Bull in your coffee. It's, 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 it's an experience unlike any other. I love Son of Pelvis. <laughs> For me, it's that Western comedies are weird. A lot of people don't like them. A lot of people through my blog, I have learned, don't like Western comedies. But what I find neat about this one is, is that rather than just be a comedy with people in cowboy clothes, which is what a lot of them are, this one really occupies a real space. It's like a Roy Rogers movie where he's the federal agent and you've got the, the robberies taking place and he's trying. So it has this sort of authentic <laughs> Western setup. And then it just sticks Roy, uh, Bob Hope, being Bob Hope, in the middle of it. And it does yeah. it really well. So if you take Bob and the jokes out, it's still, you've got the shell of a decent Republic Western there. Well, you got Roy Rogers has never looked better because we've only seen him in true color. And now we have him in real technical. And mm -hmm. of course, this was the last feature he would do until Macintosh and TJ in the mid 70s. So he was done with Republic by this time. So, yeah. so he's People great. Like, what's this movie like? And I say it's sort of like Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, but in the Old West. Exactly. Yeah, I, I mean, that's a real universal horror movie. I mean, Dracula is, is trying to replace the brain of the Frankenstein monster. But Abbott and Costello are there. If you took them out, it's probably one of the best universal horror pictures of the 40s. And, I, and you know, if, if Bob Hope was played by, oh, I don't know, um, a sort of milk toast lead, if that was uh, Tim Holt, for example, it would have been, you know, it would have just been a straight Western. It would have been Tim Holt and, and Roy Rogers. Um, right. There's, there's very little there. It's just a question of degree. Right. Like, but, and, and you're right. It is hysterically funny. It does have an energy all its own. Um, that I, I, and it's one of those that after the first couple of minutes, the next thing I know, it's over and I'm sad. Yeah. So well, I, was, I watched this yesterday uh, for the podcast. And then in the evening, I, I watched it again with my better half. And I, I laughed both times. Right. Um, which is funny because a couple of years ago, uh, I interviewed Richard Zoglin, who is the guy who wrote um, the first major Bob Hope biography uh, called uh, Bob Hope Entertainer of the Century. And, and he, obviously he's a big Hope fan. And he says he knows people love this picture, but he himself did not get it. I've heard other people say they didn't get it. And I obviously I don't get why someone doesn't get it. But do you hear that a lot? Do you yeah. need... Do you need that Western knowledge framework for to appreciate it? I mean, it's not like Blazing Saddles. It's just a funny movie. Does this one, the fact that it sort of hints at being a real Western, sort of put it in that place? Um, that's an interesting question. And, you know, I, 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 the answer to that might be the, the original film. I mean, so Son of Paleface is a sequel to The Paleface, which I think is, is an infinitely lesser movie. Yes. <laughs> and Son of Paleface. Um, albeit it's, it's still very funny and very, very good. And I, I think Paleface is a Western comedy and Son of Paleface is a Western spoof, which are which are two different things. Right. So I think if you're if you're spoofing something to find it funny, you have to come to it with a degree of love or, or don't come to it all at all. Right. I wouldn't see a spoof of um I don't know, baseball pictures, because baseball would put me right, it puts me right to sleep. So if I was <laughs> watching spoof baseball movies, like, it would mean nothing to me. Um, a good Star Trek spoof, I would probably laugh my head off. So. Right. That's, a, that's an interesting thing about 
about this movie because I just come to it and I love it and it's funny. And so I never, th- I don't think about it too much. I, there's plenty to appreciate, but I don't really analyze it because I'm too busy laughing to sort of dig in and figure out why I think it works and why it works so much better than others. You know, um, alias Jesse oh, wait, James. So why think it works? I guess the fact that it hints at being, it hints at a real Western is what makes it work so well. And uh-huh. the gags are just funny. And that, you know, we hadn't seen the Tashlin cartoon with people in it approach yet, because this was really the first one, you know, so maybe that's part of it is it's, you know, it, 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 it brings that in, which is another new thing. Mm-hmm. And I love the fact that both Jane Russell and Roy Rogers, they play it straight. You know, Roy is just like he is in any other Roy Rogers movie, but I think that helps too, is you nail, you nail a goofy Bob Hope thing to something that's that you know it's got some this firmly planted in the sand desert sand i guess you'd say mm-hmm. so do you think this is roy's best performance oh wow i don't know he's, i mean he's great god he's so good in it yeah but you know he's just being roy and i think roy was always just roy so i don't i don't think of roy giving performances he's just mm-hmm. roy yeah and so i don't know i i, I just, so coming from me I don't think I've ever seen him more beautiful. I mean, he's oh, just his clothes, and, everything is great. Yeah, and, and between him and Jane Russell, I have never seen her more lovely. No, uh, no. Uh, that outfit she wears uh, for Wingding. Yeah, uh, she wore again for a uh, uh, a cameo in Road to Bali. Yeah, Bob. Just... <laughs> it shows off all of her assets and then some. And and the camera just loves her, just like it loves um, Roy. And and I. I, I I like movies, beautiful movies with beautiful people. So <laughs> it's, it's a failing of mine. So uh, I, 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 I just think they're, they're so perfectly cast. I don't know, for example, if you had used, quote unquote, a straight Western star, if that was Randolph Scott or, or, or um, John Wayne, if that would have worked the way it works with Roy. Because, you know, part of the joke is, you know, this is an upscale programmer with deluxe trimmings and gags that you're not expecting. Right. Um, so I, I, it's, it's, it's irresistible to me. Well, it's funny that they sort of p- poke fun at Roy's clean cut image, but it doesn't, but you don't think any less of him. They play around with it, but it's still respectful and it still works. Yeah. Uh, well, and what shocks me is that, that they also get away with jokes that, that I think are, are here in 2022, surprisingly ribald. Uh, yes, absolutely. 1952. So this movie's got uh, 70 years old, but but they intimate that <laughs> that Roy is attracted to horses. Right. The bar scene. And then Hope does that wonderful take where he's uh, smoking his pipe and then he grimaces at, 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 at you know, the taste of his mouth. Horses, right. you're like, this is fun. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I wonder what audiences in 1952 made of that. It's like, is he making the joke? I think he's making. In my uh, research for this, they had some, a lot of the jokes were flagged by the censors and they just left them in anyway. And, you know, when they submitted the screenplay, they shot really? it, they shot it anyway and they're in the movie. So some of those were flagged along the way, but we still got them. Yeah. I'm not surprised. There's, there's a bit where, you know, the, the Gabby Hayes stand in, and I'm and I'm having a mental moment. Paul E. Burns. Yeah, Paul E. Burns says she's really big in in California. And Hope yeah. says she's pretty good at North and South Dakota. <laughs> yeah, those are great. And, and <laughs> Hope was just so wonderful with those. He's such a his personality is so awful that you'd hate him in real life, but he's a delight to watch in movies. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's actually funny that you say that because um the type that he's playing is a trope that goes all the way back to silent movie comedy. So if you look at some of the early comedies of guys like Harold Lloyd, um, there's even one called The Freshman, where mm-hmm. he's a, a college guy. You're, you, they set them up where there's everything about them you would dislike. You know, There's the intimation that they're either upper middle class or have money. They are college boys and, and you know it's all name brand colleges. But through pluck and sort of bravado, but also because college has somehow left them unprepared for real life. 
they're the underdog. Right. So it's it's just it's this weird thing. Every, every as you said, everything about hope, you know, is sort of generated to make you think, you know, this is not somebody I like. But he is consistently outclassed by everybody in the movie, outclassed, outsmarted, outgunned. That 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 he's he's just the total fool. Right. But but where they change, where they mix it up, and, and this is kind of the change from the Harold Lloyd formula, is that he's clearly, clearly oversexed. Right. Right. I mean, exactly. I mean, Junior Potter has got to be the horniest guy ever in a movie. <laughs> Well, you know, Hope did that in a lot of his films, you know, Um, you know, so many of them he played on that same persona. But this one just sort of ramped it up because the the gags are so over the top a lot of times. And, you know, it just really comes together and works. But it is it's an exaggerated version of what we kind of already expect from Hope. You know, in the the road movies, you know, he was that way and and things like Monsieur Beaucaire and all Mm -hmm. those others. But And the the other thing that that I thought was particularly interested about him is that is that as much as a character as as hope is is his car yeah Uh, you know the 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 western and cars have a kind of fraught relationship right Uh, buffalo bill cody would not be photographed in a car um and said that that the car was the end of the west Uh, then you have guys who sort of inherited the mantle of buffalo bill you know like tom mix for example right and then even Roy Rogers, who not only incorporate cars, but airplanes and airships. Right. Um, but the, the, the car has, you know, some of the best gags in the movie. It's, yeah, it does. It, it's just an absolutely terrific, you know, piece of comic business. Right. That they're mining for all of this stuff. So I also love my daughter pointed this out last night was that Jane Russell has a Roy Rogers record in her in her place. When they go dan- when they dance and she slips him the Mickey. She's playing a Roy Rogers record. Ah, you know, I've seen it a million times and I've never thought of it. I never really thought about it either. That cloud in my Valley of Sunshine is one of my favorite Roy Rogers songs of all time. Anyway, but interesting, you know, and so it was a, it was a phonograph. It wasn't a cylinder. It's an actual record, 78 record. So, you know, when did those come in? I mean, it's very, it's very erratic with its timing, which isn't with its placement in time, I guess you'd say, which is another B Western kind of whole, you know, throwback because those things, you know, they're riding horses and everything else, but there's a cigarette machine and yeah, um, and refrigerator. Like yeah, exactly. So it also a, pull it scale gets that. locked in a refrigerator. And, <laughs> no, yeah, seriously, that, the little light go off. I was very happy till the day you went away. Till the day we drifted far apart Now my skies are cloudy and it showers every day Now the rain is falling on my heart Cause there's a cloud in my valley of sunshine Since you told me you found somebody new There's a cloud in my valley of sunshine And now I'm lonely and I'm blue Can't we fall in love again all over? Won't you hold me in your arms just like before? Cause there's a cloud in my valley of sunshine And I hope you'll bring the sunshine back once more. cloud in my valley of sunshine 
since you told me you found somebody new. There's a cloud in my valley of sunshine, and now I'm lonely and I'm blue. Can't we fall in love again all over? Won't you hold me in your arms just like before? Cause there's a cloud in my valley of sunshine. And I hope you'll bring the sunshine back once more. But I think the car exists in Son of Paleface. Just think about this for a minute. As a cognate for Trigger. So so Trigger, you know, the smartest horse in the movies, if you discount Ed May Oliver, right. is... Uh, is Roy's mode of transportation. But then you have the, you know, uh, Hope's car. And, you know, when Roy, Roy at the end rears up or Trigger rears up on his hind legs, you know, the car does the same. Right. That's a great um, gag. Yeah. And, and, and probably the best gag in the movie is, is the Trigger car trade-off. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you I know, love- for people who haven't seen this, this is the whole movie is on YouTube. Um, yeah, it is. I, it is. I was looking for the trailer to pull some stuff from, and I saw that the movie is on. Is on <laughs> <laughs> it's also endlessly quotable, as our emails over the last few hours yes. have proven. But I, a couple of things that I want to make sure we bring up is that I interviewed Roy's daughter, Cheryl, and for my book, and she pointed out that one of the things with this one was it drove Roy nuts making this movie because he wasn't used to the leisurely pace of making movies at a major studio like Paramount. You went in, you knew your lines when you got there and you did them in a take or two and you moved on to the next one. And so, you know, a few dozen takes or a few dozen setups a day was not unusual. And so with this, Bob never delivered the line the same way twice. And so Roy had a hard time finding his cues. And, you know, if, a joke seemed to fall flat or Bob didn't like it. Or another one was that Bob remembered he said something similar in another film or on radio, they would have a little powwow and rewrite it. And so the whole process of this was new for Roy. And he said it took him a day or two to sort of get in the groove of it, but you'd never know it from the movie because he's just, he's just perfect. Yeah. And And your research is, did you, did you come across anything that Tashlin said about the movie? Well, he said that um, he did not like, what McLeod did with um, the pale face. He thought Mm -hmm. that, you know, it was, he did it as a spoof of the Virginian and he thought that it didn't come off right. And it was one of the movies that persuaded him or convinced him that he needed to start directing his own stuff. And this was one of the first. So this is, you know, like we said earlier, this is where we got the people in a cartoon thing for the first time. So, So um, how did it work with hope? How well did he work with hope? Do you know? I don't know. I never saw much about that. He just said, well, it was Tashlin that pointed out that Hope remembered every joke he'd ever told. And so he was really hard to get jokes through because he'd say it was too much like something he'd done before. He did not want to eat himself. And so there was, you know, there was a lot of that. And that, um, you know, there was the, you know, the ad libbing and the and stuff as well. So I can't argue with the results. That's for sure. Yeah. So I, you know, I think, I think one of the reasons that I, that I love this picture and I was saying before that it that it that it uh, it sort of revels in its own artifice. Right. And I think that Tashlin brings his experience anima- from animated cartoons to this in ways that you that were unfamiliar, I think, to to movies in the fifties, certainly. Right. And even be a stretch today. Um, right. There, there are so many visual gags that are clearly comedy magic. I mean, they're they're physically impossible. Right. Holding um, his own car up with the rope toward the end. So cracks car, rope, yeah. <laughs> Hurry up, it's impossible. Um, or when, when he drinks his uh, his father's patented uh, alcohol pale face, drink. Yeah, the pale face special. The pale, yes. Um, Here's mud you know, in my throat. He, yes, his, his head spins around, his body spins around, his head sinks into to his, and she picks up his hat, which is settled on his shoulders, <clears throat> and puffs of smoke come out. And, you know, that's, that's pure Bugs Bunny Daffy Duck stuff. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Some of Bob's personality sort of reminds me of Bugs in this. Some of the gags, just that sort of overall demeanor has a bit of a Bugs Bunny, you know, smart aleck vibe to it, I think. 
Yeah, it, there's a brashness to um, 40s comedy yeah. uh, or comedy that came from the 40s, like Abbott and Costello and, and, and Bob Hope, that was different from the sort of knockabout sort of uh, anarchistic comedy that you'd find in the 30s. And I think that might have been, and I and I and it's 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 also valid, I think, for Son of Paleface because it's only 1952. <laughs> is that it was um, it was a highlight of you know the, the the mythology of the common man. It's like the the all American guy who is you know equal to almost anything, and and you know this is who we are. We're brash, we're brazen, we have moxie, and that was Bugs Bunny, and that was Bob Hope. Right, exactly. That's a great way of putting it. Yeah. Well, another thing I want to make sure we mention here is that along with it, you know, sort of the plot that, that plays into stuff we we're seeing, the cast is also from Bill Williams, Paul E. Burns, Douglas Dumbrell, Iron Eyes, yeah. Cody. We get real Western people. And yeah. that makes a big difference. here. But, you know, in the end, the main thing is it's funny as hell and it it serves, you know, it satisfies Western fans at the same yeah. time. It does all the other things. I mean, everybody brought their A game. The music, the script, the direction, cinematography is beautiful. That wonderful cast. Everybody brought their A game. It's just the stars lined up and, and made a great movie. When you say, you know, brought their A game and, and cinematography, this is absolutely 100% true. When, when I think of Roy Rogers at any time, it's that last moment in Son of Paleface when Trigger rears in the, yeah. the sunset. I, I think it's it's... I mean, that's sort of the whole Roy Rogers myth there yep. in an age. And it's poignant that this is really his last major role in a yep. major studio film. And it's it's a perfect coda for him. It's 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 all it's like a Valentine to all of them. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, we have a, a thing we have to get to before we wrap up. And well, let them top that on television. <laughs> <laughs> this is called the Death Row Film Festival. And here's the idea. You're going to be electrocuted in the morning and the warden knows that you're a movie nut. And so along with your last meal, you get to watch any movie you want. So the question is, what movie would you watch? What meal would you eat? Or would you replace the meal with movie snacks? There you go. Uh, the last meal would be bread pudding. Uh, that's your, I, it's my favorite food in the whole world, be bread pudding. And I would pick 1967... Andy Warhol film four stars because it's 25 hours long. <laughs> That's a good one. I, <laughs> you, you will die at the end of the movie. I'm going to watch four stars by Andy Warhol because it's 25 hours. No, ser the, the series, um, I, I have seen Son of Frankenstein so many times that I can just close my eyes and it, and it replays on my eyeballs. And I, I, I can't tell you why it's maybe my favorite movie in the whole world, but it is. And, and my poor better half has seen it so many times that, that he can now recite it against his own better judgment. So, and it would still be bread pudding, but Son of Frankenstein, I think is, is, is just, it's. 20 years ago in the barony of Frankenstein, a monster created by man stalked through the country, bringing and killing. In time, Frankenstein, maker of the monster, died. The monster disappeared. Now, after 20 years, the son of Frankenstein returns, and fear grips the village anew. A man tainted by the blood of his father can forget his human soul and carry on the diabolical work of the Frankenstein. As a man, I should destroy him. But as a scientist, I should do everything in my power to bring him back to conscious life. Benson, turn on the generator. Produced on a vast scale, Universal Son of Frankenstein presents the most fearsome cast in the history of the screen. Basil Rathbone, in his heart, warm human emotions, in his mind, the monster mania. It's alive. Alive, you mean? Yes, alive, but alive. I thought you said our experiments I know, I know. I do thought that we failed, but we haven't. I've actually seen it walk. Karloff, rising from the past to spread new terror. Lugosi, sinister, mysterious, evil. You see that? They hanged me once. Lionel Atwill, grim hatred in his blood. 
One doesn't easily forget, Herr Baron. An arm torn out of the roots. Josephine Hutchinson, her young beauty a magnet to the menace around her. I hate it here, Wolf. I'm terribly afraid all the time. By heaven, I think you're a worse fiend than your father. Where is this monster? Where is he? I'll stay by your side until you confess. And if you don't, I'll feed you to the villagers. Well, Bob, we're out of time. Thank you so much. And let's do it again. This has been the Carbon Arc. Thanks for stopping by.